blackmail employment within the UK. Um, this is a very important subject for me as being part of the black community and also it affecting family members and also friends and I feel like it hasn't had enough coverage or it hasn't been put out in the open as much as it should have been um, and you only usually hear it in regards to people, black men in America is more talked about, it's not really spoken about here. Okay, so um, the first set of questions are going to be um, just hand-raised questions. Um, the first two questions are mainly for people who have gone to university. Has anyone gone to university? Okay, cool. And who has had a job in the field that they studied for after university? And has, this is our overall question, has anyone found it hard to move up into a business or be at a management position? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> okay, so cool. So um, I found some statistics um, that I retrieved from the House of Commons Library um, on the internet. Um, and some of the issues were published in the Guardian newspaper and also on BBC News. Um, so the statistics for black males with a degree who were unemployed from 2015 to 2016, that's the nearest one that I could find, um, was 18% and for white males was 10%. Okay, so the first question is, um, employment for black males is least likely after graduation. Have you found finding a job in the field you studied for tricky after you leaving university and why? Personally for me no, okay. because I, I've done a lot of um, like volunteering whilst at university. <clears throat> so when um, like a job would come up, that really, that really helped. because I was still studying and volunteering so they just said oh we like it we'll, we'll take you on after you yeah okay um, for myself um, I did the opposite so um, me going to university um, it was a travel journey when we were there like I got kicked out of Liverpool College I went to Morris and uh, I managed to do an access course from college that took me to university and um, once I got to university I felt like I was in the deep end so once I graduated that's when I started doing the voluntary work but I was already under the impression by the people at the university who sold the course to me that once you leave university that is when you get your job but basically I should have done what Nathan done and I should have been volunteering during that period of time because the experience is what counts and I had none. Yeah. So um, during that period of applying for jobs, I think I took the whole year applying for jobs and then it finally clicked that I need to volunteer my services to different companies. But by that time, I had already kind of changed my focus to where I graduated in media production and then kind of looked at what industry was um, what skill set I could apply my education to and the closest one for me that seemed very feasible was marketing mm -hmm. so and digital media because we're living in a social media world now so yeah and then it's just like a whole degree concept seemed like it got scrapped and now I need info, information and education on digital media marketing now. Yeah. so it took a long time and yeah I didn't, uh, I didn't get a job in that switch my focus so yeah yeah <clears throat> so with me um went to university basically to tick a box it wasn't i realized it wasn't for me so when doing my degree i didn't really have an objective or a end of where i'm going next so i was just doing it because i thought that's what you need to do to get that job you want yeah um interesting i didn't 
I didn't find the work I wanted, so then fell into football coaching, mm -hmm. and just from there I found my passion. So okay. yeah, I'm not using my degree at all. Yeah. Okay, so um, what part of your journey was most testing for you? Did you have any? Um, what was at university? Yeah. Well, I remember when I was in first year, um, it, may, it may seem silly, but I remember being in a lecture theatre in the first, in the first introduction and kind of feeling, should I be here? Okay. Because there's um, probably like just probably like 200 people in there, so like me and like five other black people. <laughs> I don't know, I'll be honest, I feel yeah, kind yeah. of like, and a lot of the other kind of people, kind of like from middle class, probably like grandmas, you know, mixed back up like from all over the world. Well, I ask a question the other black people, what positions were they doing? Were they um, like cleaning them? What? <laughs> student? No, I mean, students in my car. In the pool. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was kind of sitting there like, nah, the same for me, but I persevered the first week, it was really difficult, plus moving away from home for the first time, but after that, um, I kind of realised, after speaking to a lot of the other people, they felt the same as me, yeah. even though they're from different parts of the world and different walks of life, um, and you realise you was in the same boat. So that was, I would say that was a pretty testing time for yeah. me when I first started university. Can I say something? Absolutely. Um, obviously I haven't been to university but I've been to several colleges. Yeah. And the one thing I've noticed about with these courses or like with the whole uni path mm -hmm. is the way it's sold. You know what I mean? In different colleges I've been to like there was no talk of uni. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's one of the things that can actually affect the amount of people that actually enroll. And even in college, I mean in school, sorry, like when you were talking to the careers advisors, you know what I mean? They were giving you like low level jobs and not the jobs that you would actually aspire to be. So if I wanted to be, for instance, a, an executive at Nestle or an executive at Kellogg's, you know, they'd be like, no, 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 this is a job more suited for you, you know what I mean? And I got, when I got my work experience, you know, it wasn't in a place that I went to work, it was in my office, I was making tea, making coffees and photocopying. <laughs> I didn't learn a single thing. At the end they bought me pizza, I was like, oh, I bought me pizza, what to do? Went back to school and continued on with what I was doing, do you know what I mean? So I think that's what can kind of affect the career path. Absolutely. You know, like Nathan said, you know, he, he went to college, he got onto an access course, went to university and was told after university that you would get a job and that's not what you need. I think the pastoral care is something that needs to be looked into mm -hmm. concerning university and college. 100%. Trace, did you um, find it difficult like looking for work? Did you go straight from college and look for work? So when I was at college I was working actually. Um, I've been working literally so throughout my educational life. So when I went to school I got my first job. And then I just carry on from there working part time, but I just mainly use it as something that sharpen the skills I already had. And just mainly it was about the experience. So for example, I was working at IKEA, so I just use it. I was working so I did sales, so I just worked and just branded and crafted myself and just learned like, how to do it really because you know, make a better style, but I think that's the mindset mm. to make the most. Yeah, so uh, there's a thing that uh, my friend said to me, if you haven't got resources, be resourceful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I could have went uni because I've done well in college and school, but I just didn't see it being a route for me in the long run. Because mm -hmm. I saw a lot of people start and think that they enjoyed it, and they just left after like three months. They would become part of student finance, and I didn't want to be that person. I don't mind, it's worth it if you're yeah. staying for the long run and it's something you care about or even I think uni is good just for experiences so you're going to meet a lot of people that later on in life they'll be doing stuff mm -hmm. and you'll be doing stuff which is good compared to outside of that you're going to meet a lot of people that 
just like being up and around yeah. the kitchen. Um, Nate, you said that you had it a bit hard, so has this had a strain on your family and yourself? Uh, <laughs> probably, not that I know, just because uh, I live with two strong women. But um, most probably, like, income speaks volumes. So it's like, like your family or your household maybe getting on with things, but when you improve your situation, you improve everybody around you. Mm -hmm. So I guess so, but obviously um, during my time in uni, um, I was able to kind of apply my, my knowledge to that. A creative idea I had to do rent up bouncy castles and invest in that. So I've always been able to create another income for the household, but not everybody thinks along their lines or even has the funds in the beginning to purchase bouncy castles and then market and so forth. So I can see how it would give a strain to other people as well and how easy it can happen. So because, you know, going off of your point, so I feel like that's what it is. Like, depending on your, your culture, like, if you check that with the, like, Asian people, you know, they work as a unit, you know, mm -hmm. they have everybody in the household, and a lot of the time, like, they, 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 how do you say, channel their children down the education route and support them, you know, but it's the whole family, the whole household, you know, you'd have uncles, aunties, and so on and the mum and dad, the grandparents that work together to put money into the household by shopping and things like that where the children, they won't even pay them yeah. and then that money will then be put into education but in a lot of black households, especially like um, families that have single parents you know, there's a lot of strain on the children to then go into work you know, education is not an option after college or after school you know, for instance, like my dad, my dad had to leave um, school early to help work to pay for the mortgage for the house and afterwards help for the younger his younger siblings then to go to school you know what I mean like, that's a sacrifice. like a sacrifice yeah and obviously um, that's the case for like a lot of, a lot of people you know you've got mom like my grandma she worked three four jobs cleaning nursing home um, biscuit factory and I think sewing clothes as well in the afternoons you know what I mean that's four jobs and, and looking after how much kids, five, six kids. You know, so when you look at that dynamic and you look at the whole education fund, it's like education versus reality. Yeah. You know, and it depends on your reality. If you know that, all right, you know what, this education, going into uni is a bit daunting, a lot of people will just curve that and go straight to get any job, any job they can get their hands on. Um, so, the unemployment rate for black males in the UK from 2015 to 2016 was at 29% and for white males was at 15%. What are your views on employment for black men in the UK? Is that in any industry? Or? In any industry. Um, I think that black males are misunderstood. So I think that's a lot of the reason that why if you go to a job in the future instance, they might say it was me and it was someone that was white, they might think because some of the ways that I act, I can kind of understand they might think stuff like I'm laid back about the job, I don't really want the job as much. There might be even things such as my wording, but at the same time I probably could do the job better than that person. Mm -hmm. well, I don't think they give these days any chance for like a trial or to see how you would do under their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, like we were saying before, in a black household I feel like we're more used to the pressure. So it's like a job is probably something easy for you and simple. Mm -hmm. well, I think what another kind of um, uh, uh, researched area that contribute to those statistics is a lack of cultural capital. Um, a lot of people don't really discuss discuss that. Um, we use an example. You're growing up in South London, when are you ever going to have opportunity 
to go horse riding. Hey, yeah, it sounds like we don't care about horse riding, but speak to people that where they may go to grammar school, they live out of ends, or they'll have an opportunity to go horse riding. They'll have those kind of people skills on how to navigate uh, etiquette. etiquette. That's the word. Yeah, etiquette. They have the poise on how to speak to people, how to shake hands. Like when I'm coaching, I was, um, I was speaking to one of the players last week. Um, nice guy. Um, so obviously, I, we always say shake everyone's hand, and uh, obviously, it's a quick. No, it's a good fun man. Because I, I wasn't really taught that mm-hmm. until work. Luckily, I'm, I've been blessed to have some meet some really nice people at work and mm-hmm. teach you these soft skills. But those skills play a big part. Mm-hmm. So, like what Ruben says, a lot of them are misunderstood. <laughs> Tristan, <laughs> Tristan, sorry, man. <laughs> 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 but, but you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. when they don't have those skills, that's what I think plays a part. Mm-hmm. But if no one's willing to give them those skills, mm-hmm. They're always going to be uh, misunderstood. So it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. It creates a cycle. Mm-hmm. So when they get older, they get more frustrated. Mm-hmm. Like abundance. Yeah. Um, and then keeps going. Just, just jump on this. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. um, so you think about it in the media how black men portray. So the first thing, you, every time something happens and it's involved a black man or something wrong, the word black is in there. Mm-hmm. It's never male did this, it's always let the colour towards this. I think in that situation, how we've been labelled doesn't help when you're first trying to get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. So I've been to interviews where I know, I've had a conversation with Nathan about this, where I've been to interviews, I was the best candidate, but I got told I just wasn't the preferred choice. Mm-hmm. That sounds so nice. That is. And the thing is, you can't say that. You ask the question, oh, what, whether I felt, are oh, you amazing, you're good, it ticks all the boxes, you're just not preference mm. for this company. That is crazy. So there are, there are companies where you want to get, I oh, can work for this. So that was at, I would say, then Sport England. So that's actually one of the biggest companies there are. Um, and that's the reason why it's good. And then try and get some more information. It's like, what am I meant to do with that? How can I improve? Where can I go? So you're kind of like, all right, it's class even. Mm. And that's and that's it. So black people being unemployed, they go and find different means to to earn money because they've got a situation to look after, which is normally parents at home or home or any bills that need to be done. We're not we were we, we had a game, we came up with nothing. Mm. So we've got to grind to get to the next level mm. to get that money or to get that way to live. We don't have that just given to us, we have to earn it. So that's just my point on that. How did that make you feel like, because, I mean, where can you really go from here? Uh, speak, speak, speak to Nathan, uh, we had a massive conversation with Carl home about this. Um, it made me feel, obviously it made me feel terrible. Yeah. I wanted to like, I wanted to push on out, I felt I was best for this company. And it's just like, just got nowhere to go. You want like, as a person I am, I love to improve, I love to strive to get better. And this company would help me do that, but it's just like, just give enough until your legs are cut off before you start to walk. So you just try to look at things and try to get the best out of it. So what could I have learned from that situation? So just what's my unique technique? How can I improve it? Just refine it. And then just, just kept going like that. And then I used that experience to get out of the promotion. So took the bad, worked with it, got the best out of it, whatever I could, and just moved on, just used it. Do you feel everybody's thick skinned like you know, has it got to be thick skinned? No, well, that's the thing, I think we already are. We already have been built to be thick skinned. Mm. Like, naturally, black people are more thick skinned than a lot of people because of what's thrown at us every day. Sometimes the way you're looked at on the street, like, what you're training, you know? training, wearing a hoodie, mm. you know, it's cold, I've got a hood up, but I'm getting looked at differently. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I think we're already naturally built thick skin, so I don't know if like my dad always used to tell me, work your hardest, work harder than anybody around you because you have to work doubly hard because of your skin. That that's what I was taught. Yeah. Um, um what what I've noticed as well going on with Nicholas's point, your point, Tristan's point, is that 
it's what's being delivered to us. Yeah. It's what we have access to. You see, like, in coming from a grassroots area, as you said, like South, South London, like, what we have in our facility is chicken shops, job center, cash converters, baking shops. That's it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. When you go into more rural communities like yeah. I in Kent, they have horse riding. Like, I know two girls from the area that, that go horse riding. Do you know what I mean? And there are stables and things that they have access. But that's the thing, in, in our communities, we don't have that access. Um, and when it comes to these jobs, you know, and like, we have our aspirations, we have our goals, we, we have an idea of what we want to do. When we walk into these places, you know, there are not people there that look like us, that speak like us. You know, they, they don't appreciate our culture, they don't understand our culture, because our culture is shunned. You know, they see it as us being unintelligent, us being delinquents, us being scum, us being, you know, because as black people, all we deserve, quotation mark, is, is the bottom of the bottom. Even when you go to other countries, you know, I went to Don Rep, and the shade of your skin determines on where you work. You know, they'll have all the dark skin people working in the back, the cleaners and that, but then the light skin people are front of house. So if it's like that around the world in other countries, like it, it just shows us what the tone is here, you know, and it's like that in India and places in Asia, and it's like that in, in, in all around the world, Australia, you know, um, and America also. And um, another thing I've noticed as well is like when you go into the workplace, especially where I work, yeah, I've even spoken to the diversity liaison officer. And the focus is not on colour, the focus is actually on sex. When you look at the, 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 the hierarchy, the people, the higher ups, the pyramid, the directors, and all these kind of people, they're all white. And then you break it down, and they're white males. And then there's a few white females. And they're all like above a certain age. As, and they're all above, above a certain age. You know what I mean? But you don't really see black people in those positions. You know? and, and for a black person to actually get into that you have to either start your own business, which obviously takes time and takes funds. It's not impossible, but you know, it is, it is a hard route. Or, you have to be working in the company for over 30, 40 years, and even then, you might not bring that. So, yeah, it's... it's I've got, just to touch on your point, what, for, the, there are, for the black uh, people that are in those positions, um, what do you think their responsibility is, or should they have a responsibility for young black males and females that aspire to be like them? Because there's, I can speak of some which they 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 do a lot, yeah. but there's also some that are like, well, I'm here. If I can get it, you should get it. It's not my problem. Yeah. But there's, you know, do you think they should have a responsibility to? To be like, listen, guys, this is what I went through. Yeah. This is what you need to do. Yeah. When you're here, you still need to work as hard. Yeah. Well, I mean, for me personally, if I've been in some sort of management role or near enough a management role, that um, if there were other black people on my team, I would make sure that they sort of come correct. I would teach them certain things and how to speak, even how to, some of the time I had to pull up a couple of the boys on my team and say, you need to learn how to speak because in life, these people are gonna look at you and target you and say that, you know, you have no education because you're coming off the streets or whatever, because you're speaking slang. So a couple of times I had to tell them how to speak on the phone. And um, if they don't want to know, then I say, well, you're going to learn the hard way because even the people who are educated can't get somewhere. So, you know, in life, I mean, you need to t teach the children from young. You know, my mum taught me and my brother the ways of life and, you know, about jobs and stuff. Everyone's found it hard. But I would definitely, m most definitely be teaching my brother's kids and my kids you know, the struggles that black people had to go through, even nowadays, you know, so they can sort of have that path 
Yeah, definitely. And there's one thing I forgot to mention as well, sure. is that even when you are qualified, and even when you speak well, you're being told you're not qualified enough or you're overqualified. That's the same as you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's what you really feel, you know. Like I, I've seen some guys like they, they they fit the role, you know, well dressed, well spoken, got all the accolades, and they've gone into certain offices and been turned away. Do you know what? I actually add to that because I was speaking to my dad, and he actually wanted to be a part of this, but he couldn't come down. Um, but he's been a mechanic for how long? <laughs> a little, a good girl. And, uh, like he can literally fix anything. He can fix any car. There's nothing to him. He's yeah, he's a scientist. But he has a young white guy who's my age. I'm 26. Who is his manager? This dude can't do as much as my dad when it comes to cars. I know that for a fact. But you know, it is. It is. Unfortunately. And you know, it's yeah, it's it's really sad. But I mean, as you said, you have to be thick skinned within these within these situations. So even the older generation are still feeling it, which yes. still makes us look bleak. But obviously, we're more entrepreneur entrepreneurial. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we'll be making more positive steps hopefully. Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you feel ethnicity has deprived you from promotions and positive relationships within the workplace? Yeah, so I would say yes and no, but I'm going to say 50-50 now. now. <laughs> 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 so I would say no because, um, because, yeah, I feel like, no, I would say yes because I feel like there's been a lot of situations where people judging the book by its cover so like even at my new role at the at the hotel that I'm I currently at I've been there five and a half months and um within the first two months I had let's just say let's say 65 percent of the staff that don't correspond with me at all I've got 35 percent that really do they like and because they like me spreading interest to the rest you want to know Guy, it seems cool, but it, that this is senior people in the in the establishment still doesn't want to greet me, don't want to do nothing. They're just hearing about my good work and slowly they're warming to me. And what they're doing is judging a book by its cover. Obviously, a lot of them are from a lot of them are English and they're all Caucasian people from Europe. And I feel a lot of them have never worked with a young. English black boy that's proper South London like yeah <laughs> so it's like I don't know if this like go too far all these things play a part I know people think oh you shouldn't you shouldn't dwell on things like that but it's reality at the end of the day yeah so so yeah and um what was the question do you feel ethnicity has deprived you yeah so I definitely feel in a workplace that um, because I've, I think strategically, I kind of see where the management are coming from, I don't agree with it. I feel like it has deprived promotions and stuff like that because I feel like um, the managers and the, the, the white managers in these positions, they, they feel like because you're working, you should be grateful. And it makes sense to just keep you just as a worker. Despite all the good things you're doing, despite all the recommendations, like I've done a lot of different types of work, but they know that you know, you've got potential, but they don't want to manage your potential and make it grow. They just think it's smart to keep you at, keep you there. Yeah, yeah. Like, and it's pretty obvious that like, because yeah. But I would say, on the other hand, um, once people get to know you, like there's no color. Yeah. Once you, once these people give you a chance, or once you've been given a chance by anyone, it could be another black man. Because even where I am, even where I'm working now, another black man, he likes to call people. He, he likes to call me the bad boy and the crook and these words. 
I don't know why he says it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling him that he's older than me. I keep saying, big yeah. man, stop saying that. Sometimes I feel like it's all because there's like not many black people in this establishment. First of all, we get pitted against each other. Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't. That's like a slavery mentality. Now, nah, I'm saying it's that other person, like that guy, he's probably just like, this guy is a big challenge to me. There can only be one of us around. Yeah. Nah, I don't understand that attitude that yeah. where it comes from. But, but this guy, like, he will, he'll be in there and he's saying, like, oh, this man, he's a bad boy, you know. And I'm like, you know, it's only me and you, you know, it's a head full of different type of people. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh, fuck that, fuck that, give him the firm hand. <laughs> stop, stop that. <laughs> but yeah, and I just think that mindset alone is not good. It's not yeah. good. Because when I come into work, I have young black boys that are working there and I empower them. Mm -hmm. I say, you're doing good. Like, I ask them their tasks that they need to do, I ask them if they need assistance. And I tell them, I keep them motivated. Because the reality is, of our, of, of, of our culture is that black people like me we like to make money in other ways and it's very easy to get disillusioned from what you're doing and only follow the dark side and that is not good people need to know it's not it's, there's no longevity and things like that so I feel like we need to be boosting each other up like we need to be. if you're doing something you will not work as long because you may be working nine to five in actual fact, you woke up for work at 7, mm -hmm. you get home at 6, so you do a 7 to 6. You see what I'm trying to say? People don't understand that. But these are the hours you commit for like 800 hours. Mm -hmm. And you're not you're worth much more than that. You see it? So, like, the ethnicity thing, I don't know, man. I feel like once people are actually given the chance, the majority of the time, like, we're loved and liked and, yeah. and valued. Mm -hmm. and we have a lot to give. A lot of black people, we have a lot of soul. We have, we, we, yeah, we cut from a different cloth without sounding discriminative to anybody else, but it's true. Yeah. So, yeah. One of the jobs I was in, basically, I we, we created a new role. We came in, defined the role, designed it, and I got told I wouldn't pass my probation. Um, but the whole office doesn't run anything without me basically not being myself at all. <laughs> so there was a thing in the office, if I they told me to take a couple of days off, so I took a couple of days off and the office kind of stopped. So things didn't get done, so finances didn't get paid, equipment didn't arrive, people were struggling with certain bits and bobs that I used to do. So then they kind of realised that I was an invalued, important member, I wasn't just a disposable piece of human, um, basically. So I got, I got denied the, the probation. And that was purely because of my who I am and what I was doing. I wasn't doing anything wrong, just I'm a lively character. Like, I like to keep people buzzed and happy, be happy to come to work. Happy, work should be an enjoyable place. If you're spending seven and a half hours with people, it's got to be a place that you want to work with or enjoy it. So um, maybe I did a couple of things wrong, but there's no way I was shouldn't pass my probation. But the thing is, when you don't pass your probation, you're, not, you're meant to be let go. So they kept me on, so they tried to make it expend, made me expendable basically because they didn't leave the money. Um, moving on, they got to understand what I did, they appreciated it, and then you get a promotion. So the flip side of it is they saw that at the beginning, then they realised that what you actually do is good work, and then boom, you get a promotion. Um, so that's the bad thing. On the good side, <coughs> working in football, you have to be talented. You have to like have a drive, you have to have something about you to get you to a, a, an academy level type of thing. So it's never about ethnicity, it's not about the way you look, it's not about anything other than the way you coach. So to get those type of jobs there, like gold dust, so there are good and there is bad, but it just depends on what area. So football's very diverse, there's a lot of black, white, mixed race, Asian kids now and then. Yeah, yeah. in the no, 100%. Yeah. So I was talking yeah. to your coach yeah. about So um, when, but for that to change, something needs to happen from the bottom. And that's that's just it. So if you come into an academy now, you will actually see more black coaches than you have ever seen before. Obviously, in the South, yeah. if you go obviously more North London, there's more black coaches that you've got the skills to build with them. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Things that go on in there. Now. 100%. But obviously if you go north, it's white, white culture up there, so it's more white coaches, so, but it's now the balance is set. 
potential, yeah, yeah. 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 definitely. Yeah. But before there was like white coaches coaching black people in the lifestyle and stuff. This kid or this child, like, well, I don't understand what he's wearing, why is he so angry or what's, I can't relate to him. And now you're getting the relations in the game and you're seeing black people. But if you go to the England youth team from under 18s and below, it's black. Yeah. All black. And I just want to add to your point, um, in a previous job, so not my current job, um, it's in the situation where the, the two managers um, that said, oh, you're doing a great job, we'll give you a promotion, like a pay rise. Um, and I'll never forget, that was in October. Oh. Came to April. Yet yeah, they're still making, but what my mistake was, I was too nice to, I was still doing the job, or I was still, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I was, was inviting me to the manager's meetings, and, you know, I was giving my input. All of this stuff, and then they hired two new um, white girls um, who had no experience, and they were given the manager's role. Um, and I remember one of them. I'm friends with them still, but I remember uh, saying, "Oh, you're brilliant! Like you're great with the kids. Like I mean, how 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 are they not?" And my anger wasn't with her. It's with the system, with the with the framework, with the the culture. Um, and she even she would come to me for advice. Mm. Oh, could you deal with could you deal with little Jamal? Because he's a bit, he's a bit angry today, he's a bit aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah, I'm I, I was the prick. Yeah. Then when I finally left, I got a new job, mm. finally handed in my resignation, that's when all of a sudden oh, so why are you leaving there? It's like, oh no, you've said it from a year before and you've hired two new people without the experience that I have and mm -hmm. the qualities that I bring. Mm -hmm. And then you was left. You know, do you know, man, do you know, off the back of what you're saying, based on ethnicity, what I've noticed is, is that, like um, Nathan said before, the other Nathan said before as well, is that with a lot of these jobs, people, they, they'll keep you there as a worker. You know, and you know that you're at management level. They know that you're at management level, but they will always offer you something in between. You know, something that like a person from another race could have got the promotion a lot quicker. You know, I mean, they can get the promotion a lot quicker than you, but faster than you. And um, a lot of the time, that ties people down. You know, like I've seen people that have gone up for big roles, perfect interview, perfect presentation, perfect in every way. And then the job's been offered to someone else, you know. And then when that person decides to leave, that's when they're like, "Well, oh, we can create this role for you. We can make this. We can give you a five grand pay rise yeah. or whatever, whatever, you know, when you're going to leave, you know, because they think that you're going to be tied to that job forever. Because maybe, you know, in their minds, that's the only thing that you can get, you know. And it's about people knowing their worth. It's about us knowing our worth. You know? That's that's a, that's a a key mindset to have. Um, another thing I've noticed as well is my personal experience um, in my old job is there was a, a lady, an older lady, um, she was in her 50s and she was just, she was a, a room leader, um, just like what I am now um, in her earlier settings. There's the room leaders, third in charge, and then second in charge, and then there's the general manager of, of the set. And um, the lady, she applied to be the third in charge like four times. And this woman was really good. She had all the accolades, all the qualifications, all the experience, but each time she got turned out, you know? And um, like, it was upsetting to see because this woman was such like a, she was like a mother in, like that kind of person, you know, like an older woman, I respected her. She taught me a lot, and she helped me to actually leave that company and go into the job that I'm in now. Like, I just heard words, and, you know, just the words of encouragement and things like that. But to see her as an experienced person wasting away in that role, it, it hurt deep. And she's a female, you know, and it had me thinking, like, what chance do I have as a male to climb up in, in this profession? And eventually, I just left, and now I'm the. Position I'm in now, you know. So that's just. 
I was in, when I was uh, playing out in America, um, I was staying with, um, first year I stayed with my wife, I made really long. Um, and then in the, the last year, the last year I went out there, I stayed with my black family. Mm -hmm. um, and I considered them as, as family, both of the families I stayed with. Um, and I'll never forget, he took me on a drive. He was um, a director of coaching. Mm -hmm. um, I won't say that, but he was a director of coaching. Um, so he had a lot of responsibility. I remember him taking me to his office. And uh, there were so many trophies and certificates on the wall. You know, I was like, oh, wow. And then, you know what he said to me? He said, just put his arm up and he's like, you have to make sure you're best at what you do. Because mm. obviously in America it's different, but it's like the, first, the first thing they'll see is the black man first, then they'll see the suit. Mm. Mm. Great. And, Great. and he was like, but at the time I didn't really, well, of course you're a black man. He's just like, no, they'll see the black man first, because they will feel they have a right to question your every decision. Mm. You're not seeing them certificates of director or sorry the name on the door that says head of head of this or manager if they see that you're black they'll quite they'll want to question your every decision and he was telling me of experiences where he deliberately doesn't really to engage with all of the parents where they do like their gatherings because all it takes is one parent not to to oh you did play my daughter or when he has to have those difficult meetings, so he makes sure he, con he's, he conducts himself 100%, mm. even if he's off the job. And I think that's the important thing that we all can develop on, because obviously we're out in our own clothes, we could be on a night out with your mates, and then, you know, I'm not saying this is just selected to that, it's to yeah. all people, but what it takes is the yeah. And then you see you come to work and your manager's like, well, working with young people. Mm. Whereas you see some other people going, oh, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's always important to con conduct yourself 100%. I mean, I can, um, I'm not a male, but I mean, I can <laughs> um, sort of say a little piece on, um, you know, if um, my colour has hindrance me getting promotions. I've always been a very hard and keen worker all the time. I don't like making mistakes um, and if I do like I'll really try and sort of just like make it flawless. Um, usually I stay in my jobs quite a long time, um, like a good few years, but in previous even different positions um, from when I was working in a clothes store um, and I wanted to be a stylist and you know I had like a lot of customers who used to ask me to pick out outfits for them and stuff and um, like the area managers kind of knew me as that quirky sort of fashionable girl who knew like you could ask her what fabric this is and she'll be able to tell you but when I did go for a stylist position there was another girl who was from Australia and she was an interior designer. So who got the job? The interior designer. And um, in the job that I'm currently at now, as much as um, you know, some of the things I do appreciate, I noticed that I was the longest on the desk and other people were given promotions who I had trained or people who came after me mm. but I was working on one of the hardest like really the hardest contract on that desk but nobody wanted to promote me or heard what I was saying so um, recently they gave me the opportunity to cover for my manager and um, you know, they spoke about, you know, getting paid or whatever, but not really, but sort of. And even then, like, I still wasn't being, um, in the meetings, I wasn't being addressed. Mm. 
and the other girl who I was um, working with, I never told her this at the time because I kept it to myself, but I noticed that they were just my other colleague because of her colour. I was the only black person in that, in that meeting. And they would look at me, they would speak. If I spoke, if I said something, they'll answer her. Mm. So it was crazy, but you know, I kind of just, I knew where my place was, but I knew how much I was worth and I wasn't willing to sort of go through that anymore. Mm. And, and now, you know, I'm going to be leaving soon. They want me to still stay mm. and they want me to be in that management position, but you know, it's how it is. It's a harder journey for us, you know, based on how we actually jump out of the gates, you know, and get into work. Like, coming from South London, you know, I mean, my journey has not been the easiest journey, you know, I mean, I've been homeless, I've been on street, street culture, road culture, gang culture, whatever it is, yeah, that's, that's how my life started out, you know what I mean, and how I actually got into my profession was by mistake. You know what I mean? My uncle, he was like, yeah, man, you know what, you know these kids in the, in the neighborhood? Youth work. Got into the youth work thing. Why do you go study? Went and studied. Done, covered in the nursery, covered in this, covered in that. You know, I've done like all these little roles. And then, being in the nursery, that's what made me pursue my career. A lot of kid, children are not actually getting a start up. And then it's like, we're given a chance, it's like, all you're being told is, right, why do you go and get a job at McDonald's? Because it's easy. You know, but if you want to get a job in the office, or one of these places, you can't go work in the office because straight away, the wall comes up. And then when you do get there now, because you've been trying, you've been applying for all these hundreds of jobs. My little brother has been applying for jobs. My little sister's been applying for jobs. You get a job, the contract zero, zero hours, and zero hours contract. Cool, you leave that job, you get another job, then finally when you're sitting at a job, it's like, I've got all these qualifications now, I'm going to rise up, but then you're against everybody else, and you don't want to speak out of turn, you don't want to, you, you feel a way for asking, man, like, you know what, yeah, I've been working for you for so long, like, um, I saw this role available on the website, can, can I apply it? And then you looked at it like, how? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. and, then, and, then it, and then the face changes. Well, you can try, you know, they are these roles. How do you apply? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know, how do you apply? Come on, apply. And then you apply. Oh, um, did you get. You have to run them down. Like, yo, did, did you get my, my CV? Did you get my application for? Oh, let, let, let me check. At least times they're the ones I told you to. So it's like. Set up. Yeah, it's like you've been set up to fail, you know? And um, I think that's, that's such a it's such a deep thing. We're constantly battling. Yeah. You know, you had a battle with this lady to be in a stylist. But these times, your style is on point. You've had compliments. People are telling you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. People are saying you know that young lady that done this and that. She helped me so much. Mm-hmm. But then there's always someone better than their eyes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Hey, I'm gonna um, end on the last question, um, how have you come through this situation positively? Has anyone come through it positively? I think the journey is continuous. Yeah. Um, it's never ending, but from us talking about it openly, edifies us all, that like builds us up, it, it gives opportunity for, pardon me, it gives opportunity for the new younger people to learn. I, I believe in the idea that the new generation has to be better than the, the previous generation. Mm-hmm. In order to be better, the, the, the generation before, the age before, has to impart values. Mm-hmm. So like the students that I work with, um, they work from 16 to 19. Obviously I'm 25, so they're quite close into my age group, we took about like seven, eight years, but you have to still, yeah. you have to keep trying with them. Some of them, it can be frustrating, and some of them, you know, there may be some times where you're, you're coming home from work and you're thinking, oh, some of these guys are lost, 
But I, I cannot live, I cannot have that as a permanent thing. Because if I'm thinking that as a black person that looks just like you, talks just like you, you know, used to be acts just like them, imagine what they they would say that we can hear more from them. So we have to realise it's not permanent. Them things there can't be permanent. It's a it's part of the journey that will make you greater if you apply it, if you if you um, if you look out for one another. It's not to say I'm not gonna look out for my white friends or my Asian friends, it's not that like but obviously you have to start within your own community. Yeah. And at the moment that's why we're having this conversation. It's not to say other races don't have this issue. I'm not saying that obviously, but we have to build each other up first. And for me, that's what makes a better community overall. Would anyone like to take on that? Yeah, so to this whole journey that I've been on, I think you find who you are. You're still obviously learning who you are and what you're about, but you find out what works for you, what's what's it what it takes to kick down the door for the next person coming through. So in the football industry, there's not a lot of black coaches, but they they are trying to get there, but the door's not been it's been a job, but it's not been busted open as per se because people in front haven't realised that what I do, what I'm doing in this club, this club, it's probably reflecting on the next 10, 15, 20 black men or black ladies that I want to go to coaching. So whether you think it or not, you're living for yourself, but you are hundred percent living for your people that are coming through. And you've got to understand that you are responsible for that. Even though you might have your own selfish desires and everyone in your life yourself and then you've got your family and then you've got your other things, but we you have to give back in a different way. And with that it's making sure that anywhere you go, you've left a good mark behind for oh, you remember Nick? Yeah, he was a right man. He was back as well. I was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's true though. Yeah, it's true. true. Yeah, it's true. That's true. Yeah, we have Nick, he was fine. Oh, we have Nick, we have Jamal, we have Keisha, we have everybody that's like Tristan coming through like, oh yeah, no, cool man, there's no problem. Like, what, 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 what can't hide why? Do you know what I'm saying? We've got to, we got to destroy the stigma. Mm -hmm. And we're in a position now where our parents have broken one barrier down, they got us working in jobs like certain things and now like, we're getting a better job. Mm -hmm. So it's now our job to keep the barrier down more and then keep breaking the team and that's the only way. But then people don't try to work together, understand what you're doing. So I'm not doing the self selfish thing, the selfless thing for people that come behind me. Mm -hmm. That's just my way I see it. So yeah, that's I think it's anyone else want to add on that? Just good. Yeah, I think um, like my my part of the journey, like, like um, Nathan said, like the journey is ongoing. Um, I still feel that there's so much more to do as far as it comes to, as, as a community. Um, and I think in the roles that each of us are doing, you know, when you working with the ASDs and yourself, you're doing coaching, you're doing coaching as well. Um, and myself as an early years teacher, you know, we are helping to, to mould the, the, the future generation. Um, and, that, and that's every race, you know what I mean? We're breaking down those rules and, and tearing apart those, that, that stigma. You know, in my profession, you know, males are the minority. Black males are even more of a minority. And, um, like, I've, I've been, like, one of the, how do you say it, the ambassadors of, of the men in childcare um, um, group. And just to stand in there as a face, you know, we're, we're helping to, to encourage men, young men, to hop in other fields, you know, showing them that, that there are options. That's what each one of us are doing here today. Yourself putting together this, this, this collective you know, to discuss this important issue. Because there's a lot of youths out here, a lot of men out here that are, that are alone, suffering in silence because they feel shame. Do you know what I mean? And they can't get a job and they don't, they don't feel like they're worthy. But it's for us to let those around us know, and the younger generations know that they are worth it, and you are valued, and you can be anything you want to be. Well, thank you all.